Well, hello, everybody. Welcome along to the 11th Time for a Pint virtual get together. Uh, I am Chris. You know me. Hello. Uh, I'm joined by my host, Matt. Hello, Matt. Morning. Would you like to introduce one of our guests? I would. I would. Um, really pleased to be able to introduce John Edwards. Uh, I was trying to work out how long uh, I've known John online, and we think it's at least a decade. Uh, John's a watchmaker, uh, a watch nerd, most definitely, perpetually curious, and co host of the Off Hours podcast. So, welcome, John. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to welcome along Chris Manning, uh, who some of you may have seen in an entertaining fight style grapple wrestle punch out poster that John is responsible for making. Uh, welcome along, Chris. Thank you for having me. Good to see you. Uh, some, of you may have, some of you may have met uh, Chris. He joined us in London last summer for a mini get together. Yes. And we got together yes. in a very small room in a pub, drank beer, talked about watches and pens. Um, Chris is a silversmith, a pen maker. Um, uh, what's the other term that I was needed to include, John? Was it Giosh, artist? He's a man of many talents. Um, uh, and it's great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much. Cool. So for um, everyone that has been before, you know how this works. But for anybody that's new and doesn't, or is, it's been a week and you've forgotten, uh, you've got a chat function. So you can talk to any of us using the chat function. Um, you can talk to anybody else using the chat function. There's also a Q&A button. The Q&A button is really important. That lets you ask us questions about the things we're about to show you. And it means that we actually get to see those questions rather than disappearing into interesting chat about resting, alcohol, pens, um, not eating radium, and many other important stuff that, that is very important but it's not questions about the watches so if you've got questions about the watches please use the q a feature i'm going to share a presentation in a moment that's got the watches we've all brought along i am not going to be able to see your questions so matt is keeping an eye on those um, so thank you matt for that in advance so we're going to share the presentation each of us is going to take turns to talk through a watch save up your questions for as it's getting towards the end of that turn and matt will direct them to the person whose watch it was there might be questions from the panel we'll ask those too Everyone ready? Everyone comfortable? All good. Okay, let's do this. So, John gets to go first. Tell me when you want me to click, John. <laughs> Dive right into the first slide. Let's go for it. <laughs> uh, so this is a, a watch that belonged to my, my grandfather. And uh, I can hop on to the next slide. It's a, a picture of him uh, with my father. And uh, if kick it back to all the way to episode two of, of Off Hours, the, uh, we, Chris and I dug into a, a little bit of my, my backstory and uh, how I sort of get kick-started into my, my curiosity uh, surrounding watches. And it happened to be that I came across a, a box uh, of watches in my parents' bedroom uh, as I was doing some dusting chores around the house one day. I opened it up and there were all these watches and, and various things inside. And uh, up to that point in my life, I had only been familiar with battery operated watches. So the fact that there were these things you could wind up and they would spring to life, that was kind of mind blowing for me. And uh, so this watch in, in a sense marked sort of my, my introduction to, to proper watchmaking and uh, really did uh, kick off and, and catalyze my, my curiosity about the craft. And uh, this next slide is what the watch looked like when I, I first came upon it. As, as you could see in the, the previous picture, my grandfather was wearing it on a, a gold strap or gold bracelet rather. And uh, it's some sort of crazy Frankenstein amalgamation of a of bracelet. It's got a stretchy part in the middle and this mesh bit on the back. And uh, I find these to be kind of like wrist hair torture devices. So uh, after I had fixed the, the watch up and, and started wearing it, I decided to put on a, a crocodile leather strap. But the biggest difference you'll notice between this uh, as I received it and the next photo is the, the crystal. Uh, so I spent a lot of time hunting down a, a new old stock, genuine Longines crystal for this piece. And I really think that the crystal makes this particular watch. And I just love the, the faceting on it and the, the way that it catches the light. It's kind of like, say, uh, the, the faceting on a, a, a Rolex Datress bezel or you know, the, the grammar of design from Seiko with all those various facets, the way that it catches the light and it just changes the whole appearance of the watch, depending on the lighting that you're in and, and the way you're looking at it. Um, so that is an aspect of the watch that, that appeals to me. And then it, the next slide, you can see how it, the curves complement one another between the, the case and, and the crystal itself. Uh, it's just really neat to, to think about the, the designers and what they would have been uh, thinking as they put this piece together. And we'll hop onto the, the next slide now for another angle. And I don't 
yet know of uh, another Longines with a, a crystal quite like this. Uh, I've dug around for, for some time and uh, haven't seen anything quite with this sort of aesthetic. So it seems to be a fairly unique piece uh, in their collection of watches. And uh, can pop on to through, just kind of mosey through. Actually, we'll just, yeah, there we go. That's an exploded view of, of the case. That's the, what it looks like when you start taking things apart. And uh, another aspect uh, of this watch that I kind of like, let me pop over to the next one, uh, a back view of the, the movement, it contains the, the 9LT. Um, I, I wish it contained the 9L because I'm going to have to break it over coil, but I'll settle for the 9LT. And uh, as I think uh, you raised it a couple times for points back there, Matt, it's uh, got shed loads of chetons in it which are a nice touch uh, as well. I mean, maybe not as many shed loads as, as some other pieces, but uh, that they are a nice touch. And the one really unique feature or, or feature that I haven't encountered in many other wristwatches is the way that the, the second hand is driven. So the sub seconds hand, generally speaking, like in a pocket watch or something like that, you know, you're gonna be running that off of the, the fourth wheel or more modern watches, you refer to it as the, the second wheel, depending on where you're counting from. But in this particular instance, uh, the seconds hand is actually driven indirectly. So you're basically taking the, the pinion off of what would otherwise be the, the fourth wheel and, and duplicating it and putting it elsewhere in the watch. And in this case, it's on the pallet bridge. And the, the next slide, actually, this is another shot of the movement in the next slide. Um, so you can take a look. And then there you go. So you've got actually two jewels in the pallet bridge. So the one on the right hand side there is clearly for the pallet fork. And then the one on the left is, is what's responsible for driving the, the second hand on the front. And then the next slide over actually shows that all sort of exploded out. So you can see what the indirectly driven pinion looks like there. And that, that's the longer end on, on that piece is what the second hand is, is running off of. So I, yeah, I just really, Appreciate uh, having this bit of history from my my grandfather, something that I can, can wear and, and remember him by. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get this particular piece uh, tuned up or uh, brought back to life in, in time for, for my wedding day, because uh, looking back, I, I would have liked to have worn it on, on my wedding day. Uh, but uh, sadly, that, that did not come to pass. It was probably only about half a decade ago that I actually was able to finally track down the crystal. And I tried for a long time as to, to track down an, an appropriate strap for it. I really wanted to get a period correct one. A lot of the newer Longines straps are they're padded and quite thick, and this is a fairly slender watch. So to try and find a, a new old stock strap like that, uh, it's a bit, a bit challenging. I'll get to, to that a little more in a bit. The next slide is, is just a little factoid. Uh, I guess this is the, the guarantee card, and uh, sadly, uh, if we're honest, this, this piece was, was not guaranteed for, for generations because uh, my dad is still alive and uh, Longines no longer has parts available for this particular caliber. As uh, just a, essentially two decades after the watch left the, the manufacturing line, the quartz crisis hit. And uh, unlike, say, Omega, Longines uh, no longer retains or has any of its equipment that would have been used to make calibers like this. And, and other great Longines calibers like the, the 13ZN and, and, and whatnot. Uh, so uh, sadly, uh, this is a bit of false advertising in a sense. This is not, not guaranteed for generations. Uh, but as I mentioned, I, I had been on the hunt for a while to, to try and find a, a period appropriate strap for it. And uh, I jumped up to the opportunity when I, I found this and going in the, the next slide there. But uh, unfortunately, brown just, just didn't suit the watch, which is why Ultimately, I went with the, the black crocodile, which was also quite slim. It was not uh, an authentic junk, <clears throat> an authentic Longines strap, uh, but it still suits the watch just fine. And, and the reality is, too, back in the day when this would have been imported by Longines Wittenauer, uh, it would have been imported just as the, the watch case and, and movement and whatnot itself, the head of the watch, and a third-party strap or a bracelet would have been put on it, and that was just to, to dodge sort of import tariffs and, and whatnot by importing a watch that was not yet complete and then having the rest of the work done here. And actually for a time, if, if I recall correctly, they were actually making cases in, in Montreal here in Canada for some of the movements and dials that 
Whitnauer and, and Longines were, were importing. Uh, so this uh, lovely hog leather strap eventually found a home on a, on a more English piece. And this next slide, I, I hope, doesn't make Adrian Hellwood cringe, because I know that the, the finishing there on, on the cases is not at all correct, but this is uh, in, in true Chris Mann fashion. I picked this up on eBay for about $30 Canadian, which is, you know, that basically free for you guys there in the UK. And uh, I really like this, this Smith's and to me, it's a sort of a, a memento or a tie in a way to this, the summiting of, of Everest. Although I very specifically chose this one and went with it because it does not have any radium on it as we were kind of joking about there at the, at the beginning of the show. Uh, Cause I'd rather you know, keep, keep my distance between me and, and radium. Yeah, very cool. So uh, just to go back to the the the, the longi, what's what's the case size of that? How 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 big or small is this this gentleman's watch? Um, so lug to lug, it's forty one millimeters, but it, it's quite a, a slender watch. Uh, it's I think over twenty two across. So if you go from uh, six o'clock up to the twelve o'clock, it's just under thirty millimeters. Nice. And how old is it? What sort of date was that? Uh, it's uh, nineteen fifty one. 51. Excellent. Mm. And you said, you said it took you some time to find the crystal. Where did you find one in the end? Um, whew, I actually can't remember exactly where I ended up turning it up. It was a, one of the distributors here in Canada because I, I did find it from another one in the States as well. I think it was Perrin in Toronto that eventually came through for me. Although I tried a place in Montreal and Perrin actually wasn't able to find it for me the first time I checked with them. And then I checked again a year or two later and they were able to, to dig one up for me. So I don't know if they bought out an estate or, or what have you, but uh, yeah, it can sometimes uh, be, be quite a mission to try and track down original parts for these older watches as, as I'm sure you guys are well aware. Yeah, but especially a crystal like that, it's, um, it's so unusual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very. Good. And I don't happen to know if there's watch ever had a, a name. I've not been able to dig up much marketing material on it. So if anyone happens to know, I'd be happy to, to hear so that we, if I ever do something like this again, it doesn't have to be headlined by John's grandfather's watch. Be, uh, <laughs> Maybe that's how they marketed it. Uber, uber fast. I mean, I, I, there, was, like there was a name for some of those. The Advocate, I think, was the name for some of those um, mm. rectangular watches. Yes, yeah, so. yeah, I have seen that. I don't know if this is I this, if it's the bill for an Advocate or not. No, I don't think it does either. But yeah, it looks like a, a kind of version of it, isn't it? Unusual. Oh, someone's asking um, to see the photo again there. Chris, if you want to pop the, the slideshow back. This will be much better than, than me doing this. Perfect. Yeah. There you are, Rob. I'll unmute, I'll unmute myself. It makes it better for when I'm talking. Um, looking at in the case back where it says, uh, watch uh, Longines Whitnauer watch New York. I wonder if, from the hallmarks, was it cased in the States or was that cased in Switzerland? Do you know? I don't know offhand that. Because like looking at, at sort of other Swiss watches from the period, you, you tend to see these like really fancy cases as they hit North America with distributors mm -hmm. in the US being like, you're too conservative in Europe. We know what people want. And, and then making stuff like this, which is, is kind of really, really cool, but so different from anything you see out of Switzerland at the time. Yeah. And the case back to yeah, Montreal as well. So it, if it was, then I would imagine it would have been done here in Montreal. Well, in not Montreal, here. Yeah. We're, we're not in Montreal, but here in Canada in Montreal. Mm. I, th I think that scoop in the case at, um, between 12 and 6, you know, between the lugs at 12 and 6, is really cool as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a really fun thing. Um, Seth asked um, in what kind of state it was, how long did it take you to get running, et cetera, et cetera. Was the 9LT easy to, to, to renovate? So the movement itself was pretty straightforward. Uh, just like nowhere at all in the pivots or, or what have you. Uh, just a, a fairly simple, straightforward service, tightening up of the, the bushings on the, the center wheel and, and tightening up the barrel a bit. Uh, but otherwise, it's pretty straightforward to cool thing service and, and time and adjust. And you can see there on the regulator too, like it, it, the movement, uh, the, the movement, pardon me, the balance has, has never had any had extra material taken out of it. Uh, so it's still really finely regulated. Just sits right there in the middle, keeps good time. It's very easy to bring to within cost spec. And um, the fax spec, not, uh, like minus four to plus six is cost spec. So 
Yeah. It's pretty good, isn't it? For a watch that size as well. Across five positions, yeah. Well, I'd, yeah. I'd just do what you do. I mean, yeah. I did, I think, have to take a little bit off one of the, the screws and, and dynamically poisoning it, but it's like minuscule, hardly anything. And um, yeah, I was going to say uh, there are movements of the 90T that are, are marked unadjusted, and this one doesn't say anything about being adjusted or otherwise. The fact that it doesn't say unadjusted, I presume it may have been adjusted to some default. I don't know what the specifics of, of uh, the import uh, guidelines were uh, around the period as to whether they would have had to, to mark if it was adjusted or, or not. Uh, but I have seen other movements that, that are very outright marked unadjusted. And like I said, I, I would have loved if this had a, a breakaway over coil in it, but alas, it, it is what it is. But it, it keeps good enough time for me. Uh, if anything right now, just having it out again, I don't wear it very often, but having it out again this week, uh, the, the power reserve is not quite what I, what I remember it being. So there may be a, a little more fine tuning to do there on the, the center wheel to take out, to get some of that friction. Thank you. Nice. Okay. Uh, should we move on to the next? Yeah. Mr. Manning. Thank you. Yeah, this was, uh, you can click to the next slide. Uh, this is a <laughs> we'll just stop for a moment. banana for scale, <laughs> banana for scale, Chris. <laughs> we have to. I, I mean, I understand that most people know what size a watch is, but there there may be people in the future watching this who don't understand what uh, you know what a a watch looks like and <laughs> what its scale should be. Okay. So it you need a common reference point. <laughs> uh, you can uh, you can click onto the next one. Uh, so this is a 1940s Fears chronograph. After uh, Nicholas Bowman Skarsgård was on a few weeks ago, I figured I would uh, bring this out uh, since he didn't show off any of his family's watches. Uh, as I said, this was made uh, sometime, uh, I think, mid-40s, uh, just post-war, and uh, it has seen a pretty good life. You can uh, tell here from uh, the case and the crystal that uh, it, it's, it hasn't been particularly abused, but it also hasn't been treated delicately either. Uh, so this is something that, uh, that I picked up just before Christmas for my birthday last year. And I picked it up with the intention of having something that I could do a little bit of restoration work on and, and get it back and, uh, and looking lovely. Uh, the dial is uh, just marked fears, and that suggests uh, that it was made for the domestic UK market. Uh, it is made in Switzerland, uh, but it was made for uh, for sale in the UK. Uh, if you are looking at Fears watches of this era, and it is marked as uh, Fears Bristol ENG, then that means that it was mar made for export and uh, was sent outside of the UK. Um, yeah, as you can see here, the the gold plating has uh, started flaking off in a number of places. That's something you'll see that. Uh, see in a number of the photos as we go along. All right, next slide, Chris. Uh, and this is the dial with the crystal removed so that it's a little bit easier to see what's going on. Uh, you can see a little bit of discoloration in the dial uh, from where parts are covered with the bezel and, and other parts art. Uh, but I do like it. I think the, the coloration, discoloration looks pretty good and it's, uh, it's sort of a nice even tone across the whole thing. So I probably won't do anything to try and uh, fix that up. Uh, this has a nice uh, tachymeter scale around the outside. You probably can't see on zoom because it's probably pretty compressed, but uh, it's a nice blue color, a nice sort of royal blue. And then just inside that is the telemeter scale in red. And then inside that in seconds is the, uh, it's listed in black and it's uh, divided up into fifths of a second. Uh, it's quite a nice little chronograph. It uh, still works well, even though it hasn't had a lot of uh, work done on it in the last who knows how long, uh, but it still does run well. As you can see, the hands need to be slightly readjusted. They're not quite off, um, but that's, uh, that's pretty minor stuff. Uh, click on to the next slide. One of the features that I really like about this dial is the main numbers that are on here. They're all gold leaf and uh, they've got a, a nice black line around them to sort of highlight the gold leaf. And it's, it's tough to take a good photo of this and sort of show it off. But in 
person when you see it live it, it's a really nice effect uh, and it does co look quite lovely they uh they are you know they really catch the light and as we've talked about no radium so you don't have to worry about that part but really really love that feature here in this uh it's something i don't i don't think enough people do it's you know it's relatively easy compared to doing let's say a uh, an applied numeral uh, but it's a, a nice little detail that uh, that really really brings it alive and as was pointed out in the the chat the uh, subdials are really nice uh, they're they're um, they're perfect scale perfect size for for this uh, the one at nine o'clock is the running seconds and the one at three o'clock is a 30 minute counter for the chronograph uh, you can see here the hands are in rough shape the hour hand and the minute hand are in rough shape uh, they were their steel hands. I believe they were plated. Uh, they were gold plated, and the corrosion has just gotten to them, and uh, and uh, they're not looking spectacular. So I've decided what I'm going to do with those and uh, how I'm going to restore them. But I will do something to restore them so that they're a little bit nicer. I'll probably gold plate them again so that they uh, they uh, look like they would have originally. All right, you can uh, click over to the next slide, Chris. Uh, this is the back. It's just a simple stainless steel back. Um, nothing particularly interesting or special about it. You can click onto the next slide. And here we go. Here's the movement inside. Uh, the movement is in pretty good condition. It's absolutely filthy. Uh, it's obviously had a little bit of uh, dust and dirt sort of ingress into it. And, and there are a few hairs that I had to pick out of it. Uh, based on the marks on the inside of the case back, uh, it's seen a few watchmakers um, benches over the years, uh, but I don't believe this has been serviced any time, at least in this century, probably a little longer than that. Uh, you can see the gold leaf flaking off here a bit more on the back of this uh, this watch, which is uh, which is problematic. So as I do some restoration work on this, I will certainly be cleaning some of that up and then uh, replating it again so that it looks good. What is the movement? You know, I don't know. I haven't had a chance to really dig into it and, and dig into to who made the movement or what it is. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have a good answer to that. So is that an L in there? Is it a Landron? I was going to say, is it a Landron? Shield. Nah. Yeah, it's a little L in there, so it may very well be. So it could be a 248, but... Mm -hmm. It's but it's a nice little movement, and it, uh, even without having been serviced in a while, it still runs nicely. And as I said, the chrono works perfectly. There's nothing wrong with it, and it's, uh, it runs just fine. All right, you can uh, click on to the next slide, Chris. Uh, here you can see from the side profile, uh, this is one of the things I've always been frustrated with with uh, vintage watches is, is their size. They tend to be a little bit small. Uh, and this is actually a nice balance of size. Uh, it's a 37 millimeter case. Uh, it's around 12 and a half millimeters thick. And on my wrists, I've got 21 centimeter wrists and it sits nicely. It's still large enough that it actually looks good and that it, uh, it sits nicely on the wrist. And, uh, but at the same time, it's not this big hulking thing. Uh, it slides underneath a shirt cuff beautifully. Uh, so it's not going to destroy your shirts. Uh, so it's a, a probably would have been a largish watch at the time, but it's nowadays it's a really nice size, uh, beautiful, beautiful watch from that uh, that point of view. Uh, you can see the the lugs, the sort of the teardrop shaped lugs here, uh, a little bit better. Uh, again, that's one of the things I loved about this this case. Um, the it, nice shape to it, uh, nice details in um, in how it was designed. You can flip over to the next one. You can see it uh, sort of sideways on my wrist on the uh, sort of profile wise and then click onto the next one. And then there it is sitting on, uh, on my wrist. Uh, the strap that came with it, I don't know if it was the original leather strap that came with it, but it was pretty nasty. So I uh, very quickly got rid of that. And uh, this is just a simple plain brown leather strap that's on there now. Uh, I'll probably have something custom made for it once I've had a chance to do a little bit of restoration work on it and properly get it up and running. But uh, yeah, it's uh, a nice little nice little watch. And as I said, it's a sort of a nice size for, for what it is. And uh, it's it's got a couple of nice details in it that I, that I really appreciate. So when you talk restoration, are we going to see a good amount of gold plating going on here? 
Absolutely. I'm definitely going to be replacing the plating on this because it's it's been brassed on the, you can see on the lugs, for instance, down on the bottom right lug here, you can see pretty easily, it's it's definitely brassed heavily. Um, and, you know, the same thing with the crown, same thing with pushers. And it, you know, it doesn't look spectacular. Uh, this isn't, you know, a museum piece by any stretch of the imagination. So I'm not really worried about destroying its value or anything like that. Uh, for me, I, I want a nice watch that I can wear and something that looks good. So I would rather get it sort of restored and back up to sort of what it would have looked like uh, originally. The only thing I'll probably leave alone is the dial. I do like the sort of the patina that the dial has developed and I don't want to go back to white. But otherwise, I think it would, uh, uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's pretty reasonable. And Kathleen, it's a 37 millimeter diameter case on this with a 19 millimeter strap. Yeah, I mean, the dial is pretty fantastic, right? The discoloration is, is what you'd expect. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I suppose yeah. the, the case is also what you'd expect because gold, <laughs> gold plating wears, but if, if you've got the, the kind of the time and the skill and the ability to, to, to fix that, that's, that's pretty awesome. I am looking forward to seeing where this ends up. Yeah, well, that's just it. It's uh, the the crystal is miserable. The scratching on the crystal, of course, it's a plastic crystal, so it's it's been heavily damaged over the years. It some point it, somebody wore this as an everyday watch and did not treat it, you know, did not baby it. It was worn as an everyday watch, uh, so it, it certainly needs to have a new crystal. The case, as I said, I'd I'd like to get it back up to to looking good, and yeah, I think it's going to look spectacular once it's done. And uh, same thing with the hands once the the hour hand and the and the minute hand are, are restored. I think it's going to look uh, look nice and sharp. What do you think when, uh, when you're saying it's rusted between the steel and the plate? Is it just like some moisture's mm -hmm. got in between the layers and started to lift the plate off? Or it may be. There's all sorts of different reasons. It could be that the the steel wasn't finished well originally before it was plated. Um, it's uh, also at the time, depending on what resources were available. Again, it was post war, so I don't know what was available in terms of. Um, of materials at the time. Typically nowadays we plate with something like a nickel first and then plate over it with gold and that makes it a little bit more durable. Uh, so you know it may be that it was just poor workmanship when it came to the plating of the, those hands. Uh, steel isn't always ideal to plate over and uh, so that may that may be all that it is but uh, I think a, a little bit of TLC and I think it'll be uh, I think it'll be back up and running pretty quickly. Very cool. Anybody happen to know the purpose of the extended indices for the, the threes on the 30 minute counter? The 369? Where are we looking? Oh, the, the, um, well, everyone, uh, three o'clock. Oh, yeah, the telephone. Uh, counter, you mean the, yeah. Uh, yeah, the telephone counter, yeah. yeah. Probably telephone. Oh, so telephone. Oh, so for the telephone. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. No, uh, yeah. but so, no, it's one of those. It's one of those things, isn't it? It's one of those. It's one of those things. International. It may be apocryphal. Yeah. yeah. But um, other people have tried to say because on pilot's watches, they appear as well, and you know, maybe it's something to do with the legs of certain turns and stuff. But I, to be honest, I think telephones is as good as anything. Yeah. It is, and I love the legs. I mean, the the the, the corn de vache kind of um, horn lugs are. They're pretty awesome. Yeah, well. everything, everything about the shape of this is is nice. Uh, as I said, the thing that really attracted me originally to it was the uh, the gold leaf on the the numbers that yeah. uh, that really caught my attention at first. But the the lugs are great. The, the overall shape is great. And you know, even for someone with largish wrists like me, uh, it's a it's a perfect size. I can actually wear it as sort of a nice understated watch and um, and get away with it. Any more questions from anyone else or on to the next? No, there's a statement from Canuck in um, Canada who said that old plastic crystals emit corrosive gases that discard dials and rust hands. That sounds deliberate to me. Crystals are emitting corrosive gases. <laughs> Sneaky little crystals. Unbelievable. Who knew? Designed obsolescence. Come buy another watch. Yeah. I didn't know that, actually. Um, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, we used to use some pretty pretty horrific stuff to make plastic um, and we've got no way of getting rid of it either. So yeah, win-win. Um, is it my go? It is your go. Right, so again, trying to win the world's longest watch title award for about the second week in a row. 
Um, Mr. Jones watches. So as you can tell, this isn't um, this isn't unfortunately uh, a vintage watch. This is actually quite modern, and it stems from about 2013. So Mr. Jones are a London-based um, uh, brand designer. Uh, Chris Finn's based down in South London. Um, active member of our AHS wristwatch group, actually. Um, and it's probably been going for uh, 10, 12 years now. Um, this is, uh, actually, we'll just flick on. This is called the bait ball. Um, and I don't know if people remember those mysterious cocktail watches made by Borel, Borel, B-O-R-E-L. Uh, -E um, usually quite small with two um, often uh, uh, kind of counter-rotating or look like they're counter-rotating um, uh, um, kind of plastic dials on them um, with, with the hands underneath. Um, this kind of takes it takes that idea and plays with it a little bit. So there are two, um, uh, two, two kaleidoscopic, thanks Fudge, kaleidoscopic, that's the word I was looking for. Um, this is kind of similar except that it's, uh, it's trying to kind of illustrate that kind of bait ball. So you've got a whole lot of small fish, um, but often some tuna and things, uh, mackerel, whatever it might be, swimming around, and two big marlin. So you can tell they're marlin because they've got nice big sails on the back. And at the moment, thanks, Chris. Yep, one's at 10 o'clock and one's at 14 minutes uh, because I didn't manage to take the photo in time. Um, and if we flick on, we can see a bit more detail. The, so the design, um, the design was uh, done by Fanny Shorter, who's an illustrator, also based in, in London. She's in cockpit arts, actually, in Hoban. Um, and I've been a fan of hers for, for some time. Um, and in one of those weird uh, kind of um, Venn diagrams, she, she suddenly started designing watch dials for, for Mr. James. So she did one called the Vanille, which was uh, based on 20, um, uh, sorry, was based on um, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So there's a giant squid holding a sailor in one tentacle and a Nemo with an ax in the other telling the time. Uh, she did one um, around the world in 80 days with a, uh, a little ship and a balloon kind of illustrating the race. And at the back end of 2013, she, she did this as, as well as a ladies watch called Blow, Blow Ball based on a dandelion. So you had those, um, you know, the game when you blow the, blow the dandelion seeds off the head. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so kind of slightly romantic. Uh, I'm a diver, I like fish, um, yeah. I, I like these things. They're quartz. They're not like the borrow uh, mechanical watches, about 30, 36 mil across. Um, if we come to the next slide. Um, so they've got quite an interesting curve to the, to the case. Um, uh, well, they haven't really got a case. I mean, it's just a essentially, essentially circular case with, with the lugs that curve outwards, um, which I find kind of unusual. Quite flat at the top. Um, and if you look at the, the next slide, it's slightly inverted as well. So slightly strangely, they kind of go up in a, almost like a sleigh, almost like a sleigh or a, an ice skate, maybe with Canada, maybe, maybe an ice skate or something, um, kind of shape, a little kick up there. Um, but obviously, you know, the case is in various colours and stuff. This one's a, a kind of highly polished black um, uh, treatment. Um, relatively cheap, probably about £170, very simple Chinese courts, but they're Printed. Um, in fact, we've been down to see them, to so print them now. So they're laser, uh, laser etching their own um, cliche, cliche. Sorry, um, and then pad printing uh, down in Peckham. Um, some of the dials have up to kind of 13, 14 colours, and you can imagine that with so many different colours, um, they require multiple layers of printing as well. As Seth points out in the um, in the comments, all the watches I think have moved to, to mechanical now, which is nice. And they're also training and 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 um, kind of developing their watchmaking skills down there. So that's good. And the final um, the final slide is just the case back. There's a limited edition, so there weren't many of these. Um, made in London, as in assembled in London, uh, rather than the movement being made or anything. And finally, I there's a, I've stolen this. So I hope Crispin doesn't mind. I've stolen the, the video uh, where you might be able to see the fish move around the, the bait pool. Um, so that's the minute going round, and in the centre, you know, the, the, the hour hand at about 12, 12 and a bit. Um, I really like it. It kind of reminds me of, I don't know, the first Blue Planet back in 2007, six, seven, is it, when it finally came out? Oh, I don't know. It took a long time for it to come out. I remember applying for that when I was at university in 1996 to be a producer. 
Anyway, right, um, there we are. Really cool. Um, I will say as well, the, the trip down to see the Mr. Jones workshop in Peckham, Camberwell, somewhere down there, was really cool. Like that alone is a reason to join the AHS, along with many others. That was a that was a really good trip. So I had the pleasure of going down well. there last summer, actually. Yeah, after you introduced me, Matt, to uh, Crispin last summer, I had an opportunity to go down there one afternoon, and they showed me their pad printing setup and and what they were doing with their watches. And it, it's a a great a great setup they have, and uh, it was certainly worthwhile. A lot of fun to go down. Yeah, really, really interesting. And they're, they're an incredibly friendly bunch. They even let me have a go at the pad printing machine, which anybody who's met me knows is a really dumb idea. But I didn't break anything, so that's good. You didn't. You didn't well, break good, anything. Well, good. You're well trained. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually purchased the same pad printer based on, on what they were doing, and it's, uh, it's a great little printer. And yes. I, I ended up purchasing one of their day-night uh, watches last uh, year. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's a, a lovely design. I like, his, I like the whimsy of, of what they do with their dials. Uh, and, I think that's uh, a really good their, word, actually. Yeah, some yeah. of the the, uh, the number cruncher is great too. The big monster who's eating the eating the the hours and minutes is wonderful. So, yeah, if you're if you're looking for something reasonably priced and and you want a little bit of whimsy, Mr. Jones watches are wonderful. I'm all about the whimsy. Uh, Stuart Keller, Kelly um, says that the fact that the spring bars aren't curved to match the overall design plays havoc with his with his uh, OCD. I. I kind of get where he's coming from, but as I think Rob pointed out, I think if it were curved, it would, I think it, it almost gives a better silhouette. I'm not sure. It might, I don't know. It's one of those things, I guess. Anyone? Johnny um, I would have none of it. Johnny Ive. Many tangent breaks. Too many tangent uh, breaks. <laughs> James, James corrected me. Um, uh, it was 2001, not 2006. I should have known that, sorry. You Blue said you, you almost got to, to participate in, in Blue Planet. How did no, 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 no. When I was at, no, no, no. So when I was at university, I was reading zoology. Mm -hmm. And I was a, I'd, I'd learned how to scuba dive. And uh, a new scientist had an advert in the back for, for, for you know, people to work on this show. Um, so me, along with probably quite a few other people at university, applied. Yeah. So we'd be great for it. Obviously, we have no experience, no idea how to do a television show, but yeah, it just sounded brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so in all your uh, scuba diving, have you ever encountered anything like that giant sphere of, of fish that's on Blue Planet? Smaller ones. So smaller ones? Smaller ones. The ones that they, the ones that they filmed are massive. Um, mm -hmm. And when you get either a tuna or a marlin or a number of marlin coming in or any other species, they get, I think it's pretty aggressive. But yes, quite often you see... Um, you know, kind of clouds of fish, skulls of shoals of fish like that moving around and little jacks or um, uh, trevallies or other fast moving fish coming in often. But no, I've never seen the really big ones. That would be amazing. Um, mm. That would be really cool. But they, they tend to be open water, like proper, proper deep water. And most people just don't dive out there. It's really hard unless you're on a you know, particular, particular trip with, I don't know, Long Pan or something. Hi, Long Pan. All right. Just, just. <laughs> Just yeah, a you and Jason Heaton, you know. Heatonist, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, James said that he also applied to that, and he also did. No, I studied zoology, and we should pick up separately. Yeah, of course. Always keen to talk zoology. Um, just, I'd have to you know, just change my my demeanour and become noodlefish again, but that's fine. It just takes a couple of days. The Pretty other good. alternate, alternate identity. Yeah, one of three. There you yeah. Go. The things I do for you, Chris. Well, quite. Um, how do you tell the time? Says Anna. That's a really good question. Uh, Chris, can <laughs> you just go back? Can you just go back to a proper watch picture? Hang on. One more. Cool. Right. So the big, the big fish here, Chris, point out the big fish is the minutes. So that's pointing at just oh. about fifteen. Oh, cool. And the small fish with the fin. That's the hour hand. So it's 10, 14, 15. There's obviously no seconds. It's not a dive watch. There's no bezel. It's all cool. It seems pretty straightforward. You know, like as far as mystery dials go, as long as exactly. you know which fish to look at. Yeah, whimsy. Yeah. All right, moving on. Done. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, so Matt has brought along a quite new watch. I brought a really old watch. So this is um, another Omega because I seem to have an endless supply of them. Uh, this is another watch from the bottom of eBay. And Chris has seen this watch before, but we were in quite a dark pub. Um, we'd had a few beers. And uh, between him, I, and Seth, I think we had quite a nerdy conversation about silver and how this thing might have been made and came to uh, precisely zero conclusions other than we should go and get another beer. Um, yes. Which was probably the right decision at the time. Uh, so this is uh, an Omega Ladies uh, silver fob watch. This is stamped 935 silver. Um, it's made about 1901. Um, it's really small. This is 35 millimeters overall. And this is another thing from the bottom of eBay where myself and John and various others hang out scooping stuff up. Um, this was being, and Chris as well, this was being sold as scrap silver because it didn't work because it needed a new battery. And thankfully the person selling it couldn't work out how to get the battery cover off. Um, I think I'll be forever relieved that they couldn't work out how to get the battery cover off because uh, it was just sold as junk. Um, but I looked at this thing and thought that looks pretty, you know, I, this was, it was kind of, there was this picture, there was one on the back, it was black in the way that silver goes. Um, but underneath all that blackness uh, was this level of detail, which is, I think, really rather nice. Um, this was not bought as a watch for me to use. I just thought this was pretty and I liked it. So this is kind of whimsy, um, but maybe a little bit different to floating fish, but also in a, a thing that I bought just because I liked it and I thought it was pretty. Um, it has got detail that carries on across the splits of the case. So it opens at the front, it opens at the back, and you can see in the detail of the engraving that the pattern continues um, across when it's closed. And then there's a bit more on the hinge, so another, another kind of little bit of detail there with little pinpricks and little vent cuts out. Um, those pinpricks carry on on the openers, so you can just about see on the very edge there some tiny, tiny details. So bear in mind this watch is 35 millimeters across for the whole thing. Some of these details are tiny. Um, I, don't know if this was machine made or machine engraved. I don't know if it was hand engraved. Uh, I have got no idea. And in the pub, we came to no conclusions. As I say, we just drank some more beer. Um, so this may forever remain a mystery. Or someone watching will know and demystify this for us. Um, the details are really nice. I, I obviously don't wear or use this watch, but I do take it out of the safe quite often and just look at it and play with it. I think it's, it's really, really pretty. Um, there's, there's leaf patterns, there's flower patterns, there's um, pin work, there's all sorts of stuff going on here. Uh, and a lot of it is quite irregular. It has the feel that it's been done by hand um, rather than been run through a machine. I, I don't even know what kind of a machine you would attempt to put silver through and get this back out the other side of. Um, Chris? Do, they, do such things exist, or is this likely done by hand? I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure that this was done by hand. When you look at the layout and the details that are in here, it, there isn't a machine that you could do this on that would, uh, that would give you this quality of work over the surfaces that are here. So uh, considering the time period, there would have been skilled engravers easily available who could have done this kind of work. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure this was all done by hand. Cool, there we go, potentially demystified. <laughs> um, so here it is with the, the front open. So you, you can see there's some, there's some very thin hairline starting to creep through into the dial. Um, I understand there are now techniques that can be used to preserve and reverse this. Um, I'm kind of inclined to leave it alone. It works, I don't really want to touch it. I, I think the more you fiddle with it, the more damage you are likely to do. Um, there's, uh, there are hallmarks everywhere on this. So this is, it's actually quite good condition. Um, the, the bow is, is very tight on this. There's hallmarks on the bow. There's hallmarks um, on the, the bit the bow goes through, which I'm sure has a name that I don't know. Um, there are hallmarks on every piece of the case. Um, so it's 935 silver. So this is similar to the Labrador watch that I had a few weeks back. So this is uh, made sometime between uh, 1883 and 1903 where they changed the hallmark for export. The, the three bears tell you that it was exported out of Switzerland into the UK. The 935 also tells you that it was destined for the UK. Um, the serial number on the case may well line up with the serial number on the movement, but you need to take the dial off to find that. So I obviously have not done that. Um, Seth, Seth points out it's called a pendant. 
a pendant. Thank you, Seth. I, I knew there'd be someone here that knew the words. Um, thank you. Uh, there is the movement. So this is a 13 line movement. Um, I believe this is the 15 jeweled version. They did seven to 15, 15 being the highest grade in the ladies watch. Um, in some of the larger movements found in men's watches, there are, there are a lot more jewels present. Uh, there are also variations of this movement that have got more complicated regulators. Uh, they've got a slightly different setup of some of the wheels. Um, I, I'm gonna assume that this is probably top-ish of the range for the silver work, middle of the range for the movements that they made at the time. Um, I have another one of these watches that has got much lower grade engravings, like they're much bigger patterns, then there's not as much detail in there, um, and also has an e a lower grade movement where all of the jewels you can see on the top there are replaced by, um, are they bushings where it's metal? Is that right? Am I using the right word? Chatons. Sh is it chatons where they've got no jewel in? Oh, no. That's not it. Just a bushing when there's no jewel. Just a bushing. There we go. I had the right word. Yes. Um, so I have another one of these lower grade movement, lower grade case. This one is much prettier, so I brought it along to talk about it. Um, and there's just some more detail of the case. I, I genuinely really love this thing. Um, you don't see them very often. They're not popular now. Like there's there's no one collecting these things. Um, and when I see them pop up for reasonable money, I tend to grab them with both hands because I just like them. Um, there's, there's maybe like me and a couple of silver collectors that think these things are fun. Um, but this is kind of some of the stuff that's out there. Like I've, I've, I've found I've, I've sort of edged into this topic over the last like 11 shows that like you don't necessarily have to spend a lot of money to buy interesting watches. And they don't always have to be watches that you are going to wear or even wear all the time. They could just be a thing that's beautiful and interesting that, that you want to have. Um, and that's okay. Uh, and then there's one more of the case back. So you can see like there's some more hallmarks across the top here. Um, there's just a lot of detail. I think there's a lot to love in this tiny little watch. Any questions from anyone about anything that I've I was just really heard? happy when I was really happy when you brought this along to that time for a pint get together that I was at. It's uh, it was such a lovely little thing to see, and uh, the details on it are amazing. The the attention that was clearly paid to decorating it was uh, fabulous. So yeah, it's a, a wonderful little watch. I can't believe you stole it off of somebody like that it's <laughs> amazing i mean can you imagine if they got it open and tried to cram a battery in there oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, i mean I'm, I'm also quite glad he didn't try too hard because i would imagine a bit of force on those uh little finger lifts you could have done some real irreparable damage yeah but, yeah <laughs> anything is everyone totally dumbstruck by me bringing a lady's fob watch. Uh, Rochelle says, I guess that shield could have had uh, initials in, for example, too. Yeah, the, the shield is tiny. It is 13 millimeters tall from at its sort of tallest points to about six and a half at, yeah. at the, where it dips in and it goes up to about eight at the widest. So I've seen them engraved. They typically have a letter in because there's much room for. There's not a whole lot of room in there. Um, I, I, I think the design is beautiful. The way the, um, sorry, Kanuk points out that the blank panel is called a cartouche. Um, uh, why are we talking about cartouches? Oh yeah, that's right. Um, I love the, um, almost like the fern design. Um, there's probably a better name for it, but the way that the, the, the as uh, at the joint of the case, you get that. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, 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 they look kind of, Leafy or ferny to me, but I think yeah. it is a that fern. scroll work is based off of acanthus leaves, uh, which is acanthus. a very traditional, yeah, uh, very traditional design. It's been used since, um, well, it's been used in in, in uh, uh, documents like uh, medieval manuscripts. It's often used as a, a way of decorating borders. Uh, it's used in carving in um, in uh, architectural details. So yeah, that's that's based on sort of an acanthus leaf design. That's a, a very common theme and motif in all hand engraving. Yeah, it's I, I really like seeing engraving and stuff. I've been um, watching uh, some of the stuff that Johnny uh, King Nerd has made. So he's done like the the Urwerk special editions that have been he's hand engraved. He was a um, an engraver for I think Purdy the shotgun makers. Um, and he's, mm. he's recently hand engraved a, a metal G Shock 
I think just for himself, maybe just for fun. Um, yeah. And talking to him about like the, the time that these things take and the, the level of planning that you have to put in so that you don't make a mistake. Cause if you make a mistake, that's it kind of done. Um, if you want to follow someone else who does amazing engraving work on watches, uh, Joanna Ryle out of the South of the UK, she does absolutely mind blowing engraving work on Rolexes on, uh, um, she's done a, she's, there's sort of a, a common theme about um, a bunch of different watches that she does unbelievable mind blowing work that she does on, on those. And, uh, I, I can't, highly recommend her enough uh, just an incredible work mm. i'll go track her down i've made it oh, nice. done some work on a, a french pocket watch with a movement that had this level of engraving on it and that was to me was mind-blowing because the case it was in there's like you would have had no idea that that was inside the watch which is just really really impressive yeah it's it's kind of a, i guess we're into the world of jewelry more than watches possibly here mm. Like the, the the advertising picture that's in the journey through time is sort of this very well dressed Edwardian lady with a big hat with with like feather plumes, and this very delicate chain, like a very long, very thin chain out of the top pocket, and this tiny watch in a glove hand. You know, it's they weren't selling something that I think was really for timekeeping. It was appearance. And uh, but this is also so practical as well, right? Anytime you're decorating a case like this, uh, guilloche is the same kind of thing, uh, whether you're talking about a cigarette case or a lighter or a pocket watch. Anything like this is helping to cover up the marks of daily wear that these items are going to get. Because unlike today where we're buying replacement things all the time, uh, you would purchase this and, and hold on to it for decades. And it is going to wear, it's going to, you know, it's not made out of 316L. It's made out of sterling, so it's going to wear as you use it. And so you want to be able to hide some of those uh, some of those marks of daily use, but at the same time have it look good. So that's where guilloche work is also extremely uh, extremely useful for for hiding that sort of thing. I like to joke if um, you know if Johnny Ive had been designing the first iPhone in 1904, it would have been guilloche on the back. It wouldn't have been a you know a solid stainless steel back like it was and uh, highly polished it, it would have been it would have been decorated with something like like guilloche work i kind of like to see that yeah. a guilloche iphone well they well, actually kind I of chris actually did one. Show chris, you did, one. chris did a fantastic one uh some years ago now funny that iphone you, yeah, 4 funny or something that i think it was but I was going to say, I was going to say, I don't, I don't happen to have it here on my bench. It's at home, but uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send you a photo for, uh, and I'll put it up on Instagram. But yes, I, I actually did do a, actually, hold on. I may even have, like a beautiful a, star kind of pattern with a, um, in, 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 in a little bit of inception. Oh, you can't really see on there. No. Um, anyways, uh, I actually have the photo of my iPhone four, which I engine turned on my current iPhone. Um, so, but, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll post a photo of that on, uh, on Instagram if people want to see what, uh, what an engine turned iPhone would look like. Absolutely. Actually, one thing we haven't done is said who, um, we've introduced people. We haven't introduced them on Instagram. Um, I know John, you're not on Instagram. You're just on Twitter at the moment, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Um, okay. under the, under the loop. Um, and Chris is, um, at Silverhands. Silver because underscore got, hand. Because he's got silver underscore silver hand. hands. Yeah. Like gold man, and I, but and I take I make things that are made out of silver that you use in your hands as well. Amazing. It's almost like you chose that name to represent something you might do. It, it's it's almost like that. Almost. almost marketing. I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think I, I'm, we're, we're almost on the hour. We've done phenomenally well. Normally we, we run over. And uh, Can Chris discuss his work on pens, John asks. Chris, do you want to talk about I pens? I certainly can. I, I'm, I'm you, happy sir. to talk about pens. All right. Uh, I started making pens a number of years ago, and uh, I turned it into my full-time job uh, a little over a decade ago. Uh, I was in the IT industry, and I'm mostly better now, and have you know, have, have gone over to, <laughs> sorry, that, <laughs> um, have gone over to doing this, this work full time and pens have been my primary business for a long time. Uh, I'm, I'm slowly moving into making watches as well. Um, my pens are almost exclusively made out of silver, although I do make them out of, uh, gold occasionally. And, uh, every once in a while I will 
do something like this out of a stainless Damascus, uh, which you probably can't see very well in there. I'll post photos of some of the stuff on um, on uh, Instagram so you can see what uh, what's going on. But uh, I tend to do a lot of work in um, in heavier pens because I've got bigger hands and I enjoy larger writing instruments. And I couldn't find the pens that I wanted for a price that I could afford, so I started making them. And uh, that's sort of where I'm going with my watches as well. I can't afford the watches that I want, so I'm going to make them. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's sort of what I do and what I've been uh, what I've been working on for the last 13, 14 years. And if someone wants to come and have a look at your pens and potentially talk to you about buying one, where do they go? Silverhandstudios.com is the best place to go for, for my pens. Uh, also Instagram, as uh, Matt said, silver underscore hand is where I am. Uh, I do tend to post about stuff that I'm working on there. Um, so the, the new watches that I'm working on right now, I'm actually uh, getting very close to posting photos of some of the, um, some of the first ones that I'm going to be releasing. If, uh, if only the world would get out of this pandemic and lockdown, I could finally get movements from my watches. Did you, sorry, did you say pandemic? Has shut down. Pandemic. Pandemic. Oh, pandemic. pandemic. Oh, I was about to say, you, <laughs> seriously, you can't make light of these things. If there was a pandemic, Chris would be very happy. Oh, that would be lovely. I'd love it if there was a pandemic. No, it's, uh, you know, the, the thing that's slowing me down right now with the watches is, is uh, Switzerland is shut down and isn't making anything, yeah. so... Once uh, once they get back to uh, to work, then uh, hopefully I can get a watch out soon as well. I'll have to come, I'll have to have you back on when. Um, well, I, oh, actually, it'd be better to see you in person, but um, I do have you well, back on. Well, that's the other got, thing is once the watch to show as well, rather than that paper. The, the paper pandemic is did. over. Yeah. Well, no, this this one doesn't have a paper dial on it, but um, yeah, once the pandemic's over, I can actually fly over to the UK again and and meet all you lovely people in person. We, we, Again, we, prom right? we promised Bill on Friday night that we'd go to New York, so we'll do New York and then Canada. We'll make a tour of it. Oh, yep. See Kathleen. Come to uh, Ottawa. This is lovely. Yeah. yeah. We could go to Paris to see Rob and his watches as well. Rob's making watches, uh, Montmartre um, watch. Uh, Rob, you'll have to put the link in. I can't remember what it was. Montmartre. Time like for a pint world tour. Yeah. Right. Amazing. I'm totally Wonderful. up for that. So there um, we are. Another <laughs> successful Sunday. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. been a good one. Um, thank you to, uh, to Chris and to John for joining Matt and I. Thanks, guys. Much appreciated. Thank you. Um, thank you too for hosting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank to, you for having us. You're very welcome. Thank you to Matt again for being a fantastic co-host. Um, thank you to uh, all the people that have joined us live. And if you're watching this recording uh, on YouTube, thanks for watching. Um, if you're watching the recording, please hit the subscribe button. Do me a favor. Join us. Um, and we'll be back next week. See you again soon. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Cheers.